last encounter, in our last encounter, we we saw the con the conceptual implication of this idea and the assimilation with God. So we are still continuing on uh, this topic, and today, um, Eliakwe will be presenting the essential good goodness of the human nature and the potentiality and Martian practice. Um, we remind ourselves that we are beings always becoming. So we are beings and always in the process of becoming. And somehow what we are being presented these, these days help us to articulate better and to understand this African concept of our beingness and also the call to become even more. So without further ado, I invite Eliakwe to do what he knows how to do best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening to all of you. Yeah, welcome to this uh, uh, second part of the perfectibility of uh, humans. I hope you can hear me very well. Yeah. Um, yes, just hold on a bit. Let me put on the video. Yes, good. So we are here again, once again, to talk about the perfectibility of humans, part two. And last week, uh, it was a very interesting, uh, a lesson and I hope to uh, make this one as well interesting for you. So we talked about conceptual implication of the perfectibility of the humans and also assimilation with God. And I believe you all are very conversant with these terminologies and what they imply, what they mean. Today we are going to be looking at the essential goodness of human nature, and also the potentiality and Martian practice. So when we talk about the essential goodness of human nature, we are looking at the African concept of the human person conceived through the Martian anthropology. That is how the Martian anthropology, that is how our ancient fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters, our Africans, uh, ancient Africans, how they considered the human person they consider the human person to be essentially good. And when we use the word essential, it means that we are looking at something that is deep, that is in its nature, by its nature, it is good. Why is that? The human nature is endowed by the creator. The principle of creation is math. Math is the constitutive constitutive element of the creator in his likeness. That is mat. Since that is mat, that is the likeness, that is the, the what makes the creator is mat. That is the principle that guides the creator is mat. The, the principle, please, can we put off our, can we put off our mic so that it will not disturb the, uh, the lesson? So if your mic is on, please mute it. Thank you. So we can sorry for that break in transmission. So we'll continue. So from the African perspective, remember that what we are, whatever we are doing here today, we are looking at it from the African perspective. And if we're going to bring in uh, other views, they are going to be we are going to be looking at them from their conceptual views, their conceptual views. So since math is one with the source, and since the human nature is the creation of math, therefore it is rooted in math. And if it is rooted in math, then it is good ontologically, ontologically good. That is the human nature in its creation, its nature, its nurturing nature. Is good. 
So the above idea emphatically negates the concept of sin. So when we talk about, oh, sin, now the idea will now be, what do you mean by sin? If you say what I just said now negates the concept of sin. In the Kemetic moral literature, moral offenses are not regarded as sin. In the David Shenum's English Egyptian index of Faulkner's concise dictionary of Middle Egyptian, there is no listing for sin. However, there is ample listing with many overlapping for wrong, wrongdoing, evil, evil doer. Actually, if we're talking about the essential good of the human nature, then what I will explain later will make you to understand why uh, in the African concept of uh, evil and what have you, they don't consider it a sin. But the question would be that, what is the difference between wrongdoing and sin? What's the difference? What's the difference? So the concept of sin in Abrahamic religion and math, the concept of sin in Abrahamic religion has an ontological and spiritual dimension. That is that radical evil that alienates us from God. Even John, John talks about it. The concept of sin in math is moral and behavioral. So this is a practical difference. This is a, um, a clear and evidential difference. The first one talks about the ontology, that is, that is man or the human person in itself is sinful, is damaged, condemned. So if that is the conception, then we cannot be talking, if that is the conception of the math or the Africans, ancient Africans, then we cannot be talking about the essential goodness of the human nature. But for Matt, for the Africans, for Martian anthropology, sin is seen from moral and behavioral. So what are the implications of these two approaches and worldviews? The Christian doctrine says that everyone is born sinful. This means that from birth, there is a built-in urge to do bad, to do bad things and to disobey God. The concept of original sin was explained in depth by St. Augustine and formalized as part of Roman Catholic doctrine by the councils of Trent in 16th century. Original sin is not just this inherited spiritual disease or defect in human nature, it's also the condemnation that goes with that fault. Hence, the fact that you are born automatically means that you are sinful and condemned. So sin is a condition that you are in. So it's a condition that you are in. It's not something that people do. It is what you are, you are, you are in. And that is why if you move further, and when one is born, you are asked to do baptism so that that sin can be cleansed off. So you need to do that baptism. You need the grace of God for it to go off. But the African concept is saying that, no, ontologically, you are good. There's no sin. But if you do something bad, it is moral and it is prone to change. But ontologically, it is not prone to change, except when you are given that opportunity of baptism in the Catholic Church. So yeah, you can see it here, even a newborn baby who hasn't done anything at all is damaged by original sin. This is the idea of original, this is the idea of original sin that uh, the human person essentially is sinful, is damaged and all that. So we had to, uh, Karenga had to bring this in to be able to explain uh, the Martian anthropological concept of uh, the essential goodness of human nature, because it needs something to actually compare to explain his points. So the effects of original sin, 
Original sin affects individuals by separating them from God and bringing dissatisfaction and guilt into their lives. How to cure original sin? One cannot cure original sin. It is only by the grace of God. So to be able to explain the difference between uh, the original sin or sin in the Abrahamic uh, understanding and uh, the Kemetic uh, view, Karenga used these two Kiswahili words, Dambi and Kosa. It says, the difference between Kemetic concepts of moral failure, wrongdoing, offense, and the Jewish Christian Islamic notion of sin can be seen in the difference between the Swahili words kosa in the plural word, in the plural uh, term is makosa and dambi. Dambi is derived from Arabic and it's used to translate the concept of sin as defined in the three Abrahamic faith. A Swahili dictionary, Kamusu ya Kiswahili Sanifu defines Dambi as Rosa, I cannot read it now. That is an offense which violates a religious common or law. While Kosa stands for Wazo Tens Au Dambi, I cannot read that. A thought, act, a thought, act or matter which is against a rule, protocol, or law. And in the religious setting, its primary meaning as verb is this, as it is written here, that is do what is incorrect or what is forbidden, to do wrong, have gone astray, or turned aside. Another Kiswahili uh, dictionary, the standard Kiswahili English dictionary, List of meaning of kosa as a verb, its primary, primary meaning is that it makes to make a mistake, mistake, do wrong, offend, go astray, blunder, err, fail to get, hit, find, or attain, miss a mark, fall short, be deficient, etc. And as a now, its meanings are likewise mistake error, fail, failing, failure, defect, wrongdoing. Hence, the essential meaning in all of this is the fact that the kemetic concept of offense speaks to immoral failure that is behavioral, hence changeable, not ontological, which requires divine alteration in some way. Thus, in the Martin theological ethics, there is no sin, and likewise, there is no need for either conversion, either conversion or salvation. So, what scholars say? C.J. Blecker is a Dutch historian of Egyptian religion. Although he uses the word sin to describe offenses in ancient Egyptian ethics, he correctly defines the kemetic conception of moral offense. According to him, a striking feature of the Egyptian language is that sin proves to be closely associated with the disagreeable, with foolishness, and that guilt is linked with the idea of error and with the financial and judicial. In fact, this description reflects not a conception of sin and guilt, but of error, offense, and shame. For he goes on to say that the ancient Egyptian sense of wrong, do, of wrong does not originate from feeling of unholiness, but in the sense of regret that he has been foolish and that he has therefore acted badly. So we are looking at it from the view of uh, C.J. Blicker, talking about how even though he uses the word sin, even though he uses the word sin, but the meaning that attaches to it is all the same about something that has to do with moral uh, wrong. Henry Frankfurt also, the Egyptian views his misconduct not as sin, but as aberrations 
Because when you are saying sin, the word sin in this sense here is looking at it from the Abrahamic understanding of sin, that is original sin. But as aberrations, they would bring him unhappiness because they disturb his harmonious integration with the existing world. Thus, he who erred is not a sinner, but a fool, and his conversion to a better way of life does not require repentance, but a better understanding. A better understanding. Because you are sinning or you are doing wrong because of ignorance. You are ignorant. So Frankfurt continues that lack of insight or lack of self-restraint was at the root of man's misfortunes, but not a basic corruption. Basic corruption here means that from the beginning, there was already an underlying corruption that you already condemned, you're already evil. But that is not it. In this view, humans, humans are neither evil by nature nor sinfully corrupted. And thus, one is capable of self-transcendence by self-understanding. So now the point is that if your wrongdoing is coming from the fact of ignorance, so there's that possibility and that we will see in the terms of potentiality because potentiality is all about possibilities. So there's that possibility for you to self-transform, to do good. So you self-transform because of what? Self-understanding. You've been able to get understanding and as a result, you change your ways because you now know so you change your ways. So he is saying that it is self-transformation rather than grace. For it is not by the grace of God, but by following his way. Math, that is posed as the key to moral grounding and human flourishing. So it is not by the grace of God that you are saved from the African perspective, from the ancient Egyptian perspective. It is not by the grace of God, but it is by following the way of God. And that is smart. And what is smart again, if one look at it, it the, the principles of truth, justice, and balance. In Kemetic religious and ethical thought, the proper attitude towards moral offense and failure is not guilt but rather shame. In this line of thought, Herbert Fingeret drew an important distinction between guilt and shame in the Confucianism. He used this idea of the Confucianism. Guilt, he notes, comes from an inward sense of stain, which has no ground in, Confucian, in Confucianism. So also, this inward sense of stain is looking at original sin from that perspective that's by nature or by this basic uh, formation, you are already a sinful person. You are already like damaged and condemned. And that has no root or no ground in Confucianism. He says, it is an inward state, a, repugna- a repugnance as inner corruption of self-denigration of the sense that one is as a person and independently of one's public status and repute, mean and reprehensible. He added that guilt is an attack on oneself, whereas shame is an attack upon some specific action or outer condition. Shame as a condition caused by an outward factor, that is an offense, failure, etc does not reflect or generate a sense of profound inner stain. Rather, it calls for corrective measures to alter the outward condition which has generated it. It is very clear, this distinction between guilt and shame. Guilt comes from an inward reality of stain, while shame is from the outward uh, sense of or the outward uh, actions of the person who is involved. So you do something wrong, you are shame. What the effect of it comes to you as shame, and that can be altered, that can be corrected 
it can be, you can undo it. You can become a good person later. So from the Mahatan perspective, the human nature is intrinsically good because it was created by God through Mahat, and hence the actions of the human person cannot denigrate its original substance, which is Mahat. To Mahat for the Africans or the ancient Egyptians, for Mahat is the basic foundation of the human nature. And ontologically, it is good. Your actions now, cannot stain or denigrate this foundation. The foundation is already good. So your actions are only moral or ethical. So those moral and ethical, they can easily change. So when talking about the essential goodness of the human nature, ancient Africans, ancient Africans draw the conclusion from the fact that, that they are the image of God moving towards perfection as they constantly strive to assimilate with their creator. Hence, human nature is not intrinsically faulty, but good. Nothing like sin, but moral failures, which are changeable. One is born, not in sin, but in the context of possibilities. In the context of possibilities. So we move now to potentiality and Martian practice. Potentiality, limitless possibility. The human person has an ontological potential which is rooted in essential goodness. So as we saw the other time, we're talking about strive for, uh, to strive for perfectibility. So that strive is this potential that put you, you have the potential to become that goodness, that essential goodness that your nature already, already has. The evolution of potentiality concept. The old kingdom, in the old kingdom, as we saw also before, uh, and also in the area of the uh, image of God as uh, Father Osero More, uh, uh, rightly and uh, excessively uh, explained to us in the old kingdom this idea was exclusive for the king this was uh, an idea that was uh, uh, given to the kings that uh, they are the ones that have that uh, potentiality towards uh, becoming like god and things like that so in the new and intermediate kingdom it was now extended to all as we have a scene and read or, uh, before already. So the potentiality concept from the period of the old kingdom holds that it is the ontological potential reserved to the king. Hence, in the early period of Mahatian theology and ethics, the king is the paradigmatic human. He is the one, he is on one level, the nature, that is the goodness, the beauty, and all that. And in the available literature where these informations are present, at this point, he is the exclusive possessor of this potential. But with the end of the old kingdom, this godlike potential is now open to all. An example of this is when Radu Knum, uh, this person, I tried to research on him who he is. I think he is one of these teachers, the mystery school teachers. He described himself as godly to behold and a precious staff made by God. So now the potential that each one has to strive to work in goodness, this essential goodness of their nature to assimilate, to become like God. So examples of this claim to God-likeness are evident from the first intermediate period through the late period of kermetic history. So another example, as noted by Frankfurt, is the definition of uh, her to definition of her affinity and oneness with Amen Ra in terms of Maat. I have offered Maat, the Maat which he loves. I know he lives by it. It is my bread and I drink of its dew. I am as one body with him. So with this conception, with this idea in the minds of this people, because this 
uh, literature that we are reading that we bring that we are seeing here these are the things that they had written this mindset today we might be looking at this as something wow <laughs> is this actually real and things like that but in their time they paid so much attention because that was the world view that was the perspective that was the way they saw themselves that was this that that was the the, the goal they were striving to attain so it was for them the reality but for many of us today <laughs> this is not possible but that is not the that is not the point and we shall see this view as we move on so the ontological ground for this god likeness is math which is defined not only as a divine natural and social order but also as the essential substance and sustenance of god and king it is the essential substance. So if, as we have said before, I think it flows logically, it flows logically. If math is the essential substance with which we are created, with which the whole world is created, and what sustains the world, then we should be looking at, we should be actually trying to go back to this understanding to this worldview and see what to draw from it to move on as our philosophy in the correct Connect africa foundation the sankofa philosophy because they have written so much on this definitely it means that that was how they were living their lives it doesn't mean that oh there were no bad people or people were not doing wrong no as they said it's moral fault so since they will recognize that fact that sin for them is moral, is behavioral, and it can change. It means that this was what they were invested in. This was what they were invested in. Math then is the grounds for the ontological unity between God and humans. And thus, no ontological gap exists between them. So there was no ontological gap. So when we talk about ontology, we're talking about the nature of the thing itself, the nature. And even the scripture says that after God that created, and he said, it was good. It was good. So by nature, by its, by its form, it was good. Or not, not for the African, it's not even worse. It is because it continues to be good. So if Mahat, that is the spiritual vertical, uh, uh, the spiritual dimension of humans is the critical constitutive element of being human, then math must be cultivated by righteous thought, emotion, speech, and conduct in order for each human to realize his or her potential fully. The endpoint for the kings is, is uh, a godhood or god-likeness. But for the ordinary citizen, it is potentiality. However, every person has that potential of becoming good. Therefore, in the book of Vindication, when the righteous dead rise and stand vindicated, Ma'akeru, before history and heaven, she says, or he says, now the length of the sky belongs to my strides and the width of the earth belongs to my domain. For I am he or she who is one with God. I have become him. This in Martin theology is an expression of the concept of spiritual assimilation through righteousness. In a word, by becoming the embodiment of Mart, that is the image and essence of God as discussed above. Yes, this is it. So when we talk about this essential goodness of the human nature, it doesn't mean that you don't have a work to do. You have a work to do. You have work to do. You have to keep striving and keep working on yourself, keep doing good to do what? To assimilate, to be like God. That is the idea. That is the goal. So it says here, for I am he or she who is one with God. I have become him. I have become him. And the person who is speaking here now is the vindicated person. The person that after dead, 
after the person uh, has died, now rose, stand vindicated, and that person is the Makeru who has who has gone through all this the vicissitudes of life and were able to stand vindicated and stand firm at that. At all. In my time on earth, I was able to do good. And as a result, I am now one with my creator. I am now one with my creator. So it is important to state that the ideal of perfectibility is very real to the ancient Egyptian, like what I was saying before. It, it, it's, a real, it's a real reality. It's, it's not something that or they just say or just talk and it's not real or you meet, no. So in both the declarations of innocence and the declarations of virtues, the presentations of the moral personality as befitted its nature was declaratory, not rather than narrative. As Lichem states, given this, the modern reader is likely to doubt their veracity, but such doubt is besides the point for what matters is the possibility of perfectibility and the values which promised this were re recognized and formulated not as remote ideals preached by saints only to be disregarded in the real world no on the contrary these values represented precepts that any well intentioned person could fulfill Thus, the striving for progressive perfection has a lived concreteness to it, a set of values reflected in the ethical literature, especially the declarations of innocence, the declarations of virtues, and the sabbat, which became both the task and goal of the Martian life. It is so, so clear with this that what we have been saying is not something that is unreachable or undoable. These things were real, as I was saying earlier, real and concrete. This was what uh, guided our forefathers and they were all trying or striving to gain that, uh, that, that reality of assimilation with the creator, assimilation with God. So it was the task and goal of the Martian life. It was something that they had to do. It was something that they, that without that, they were not actually even the Egyptians because that was what made them who they were. That was their culture. So understanding this, uh, this, this, uh, this lecture of, understanding this lecture uh, of, uh, potentiality of the essential goodness of the human nature makes us to understand the worldview of our forefathers, how they saw life, how they took moral, uh, moral rea uh, reality, their conception of sin and all that. So my dear uh, friends, this is the end of uh, this lecture, Ket Nebet Neferet. Our source remains the moral ideal in ancient Egypt by Karenga Maulana. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Indeed. We are in the state of being and yet becoming. I'm very sure that what you have delivered tonight and uh, it requires a lot of time for us to, to digest it and to reconcile a lot of things, uh, a lot of opinions and ideas that we have already carried in our minds with the new perspective you are presenting us. Um, so thank you so much for doing justice to this, um, to this presentation. And shortly, we will open the floor for people to um, come up with their questions and their observations. But before we do that, I would like to invite you to try and find out in your language how the concept um, of wrongdoing is expressed. The concept of aberration, the concept of 
de departing from what is right, how is it called in your language and what does that mean? Because for instance, while Eliakwe was speaking, I can be invite wisdom one one of Sakye to kindly put up the his or her mic. Because he's interfering with our presentation. Thank you. So for instance, in my in my language, the, the idea of of wrongdoing. A wrongdoing is called emiebe, okay? Something that is not right. And someone who does emiebe is called olwemiebe, olwemiebe. And this actually helped me as a person to, to enter into the mindset of, of our ancient fathers, brothers, and sisters while Elihu was making his presentation because the idea, for instance, in my language of emiebe has to do more with an action that someone does and not the nature of the person. So you might be surprised that when you visit a lot of our African languages to discover that the idea of wrongdoing is not so much attached to the beingness you know, of a person, but the activity that that person does that destroys, you know, the harmony in himself or herself and in the society. So it might be good for you to try and visit and find out how you express this in your own um, African uh, languages. Now uh, we have Ben Mario, please. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Father. My question is, since one is not born in sin, but in the uh, context of a possibility. I don't know, can you explain more detail on, on that statement that one is not born in sin, but in context of possibilities? I don't know. Okay. Now, uh, in this uh, presentation, I gave a, just as uh, Karenga, the, the test that we are using, as he had put it, in that uh, particular uh, presentation, I gave the understanding of uh, sin, the word S-I-N, sin, as used by the Abrahamic uh, religion. We are talking about the Abrahamic religion. We're talking about uh, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. So the way they understand uh, a sin, but also, I also made uh, a reference to how uh, the ancient Africans considered uh, that. In fact, the word sin, as it is there, it's not even, it's not in existence. It's not in existence, but they use the word wrongdoing, evil doing, and all that. Now, from the perspective of the uh, Abrahamic religion, sin is something ontological. That is, you are born sinful. And as we know from the Christian perspective, we look at that from the idea of the original sin, uh, Adam and Eve, the sin of Adam and Eve. And when you were when we were born, uh, we that's that's uh, that's nature is transferred through sexual intercourse. What Augustine called uh, concupiscence is transferred to the generation generations that are being born and things like that. So it is uh, transferred. But the, uh, the Africans, the ancient Africans, did not see it that way. They had a different perspective because uh, the human person is, uh, is, is made or came into being through Maat. Maat is the source. And as we said, everything about Maat is good. The principles of Maat in, its, in, in itself is good. So if you are coming from that principle, it means that your nature is good. So there is nothing that is ontological about, uh, there's, something, there's nothing wrong ontologically to you at the point of your existence, at the point of you coming into being. So you are good by coming into being. Now, when we're looking at the saying that it is uh, in the uh, context of possibilities, is that you at this point in time 
you coming into being, you are good. Your nature is good. Now, the possibility we are talking about, about the potentiality we are talking about, is that you now have to act in math to be able to do what? To assimilate. Assimilation, as we know, as we explained uh, last time, is that you are striving to become one with math, one with your creator, one with that principle that had made you to become one with it. Because as a human being, you are great, you are gifted with the, uh, the gift of reason and freedom. So you can choose not to, you can choose with your actions and your behaviors to do good or do evil. You can choose. So there's that possibility. You have the possibility. You are not made and say, okay, you are good and you cannot now make decisions, no. Your nature is good. Your nature is good. But now, as a human being that you are, in that your nature, with the influences that happens in your reality and what have you, evil comes, good comes, and things like that. You act, whether in evil way or in good way, depending on your information or your formation, because it says that those who do evil are ignorant. Now, if they become knowledgeable, automatically knowledge of good and you accept that knowledge makes you to do what? To change your ways. That is why it says that it is ethical. It is behavioral. It is something that can be changed. So you change your ways and now you start doing what is good. So that is what we mean about that possibility that's a context of possibility, that you have the possibility to do good or evil. But in those days, those people, their mindset, according to what we read, their mindset is to do good, to be united with their creator. But that does not mean that they don't fall short. But even though they fall short, intrinsically and ontologically, they are not bad people. They can change, just like you and I. We are not intrinsically or ontologically bad and condemned that we can never do good. No. We are, we are in process. We are striving always to do what is right. So that is what it means. I hope uh, I was able to answer that. And if there's any other person that, has a, that wants to add to that, can, the person can do that. Yeah, we, we have uh, also a contribution in the chat. Um, become what you are. And I think that is really the key, like Aleakwe has beautifully said. So like we expressed before, you are in the state of being and becoming. So the only possibility for you to become even more is because you already are. So become what you are, manifest your goodness, leave your madness. And it is important for us to remember that African spirituality is a knowledge-based spirituality. Knowledge-based, what does that mean? That we are always growing and maturing in knowledge for us to be able to practice well the principles of Maat. So become what you are, that is the mission that is entrusted to you. So we cannot talk about gift and responsibility. The gift that you have is that you are already divine, but the responsibility given to you is to make that divinity to blossom. So now we invite uh, Afola and Francis Shegun um, to make okay, uh, good their contribution. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you. My question is, Going by your definition of uh, Mahat uh, perfectibility, uh, I can see something very, very unique there. I, I, and I must say that it's, it makes a lot of sense. But the, my question is that since the Martians, they conceive man to be perfect in nature, that is ontologically good. Why is it that to postulate this goodness now falls under the sense of striving, because you even used the, uh, the term recently that you now strive. Why is it that we now have to strive to postulate this goodness, to put this goodness 
into act if we are ontologically good. Thank you. Good, very nice, uh, interesting question. <laughs> if you're ontologically good, why do you have to strive again? So if you cannot, if you don't have to strive again, then you're like a robot. God has created you and put goodness in you. Like what uh, uh, Father Oseromori was saying, become what you are. Become that nature which you are. Now, the Africans, the ancient Africans looked at sin from behavior. Behavior, uh, our behaviors are kind of influenced by different situations that we find ourselves. But that does not mean that when you do wrong, when we talk about even conscience or that particular thing that is in your heart that's only telling you that, oh, this thing you did is wrong. But sometimes you don't, you don't answer or you don't respond to it. You don't listen to it. But it tells you that I have done something wrong. It tells you that you have done something wrong. That is your, that is your essential nature. That is good. That is telling you that this thing you've done, it is wrong. Or this thing you've done, it is right. It claps for you and all that. So there's something even within you that is telling you that my brother or my sister, that thing you have done all good though. But that thing you have done is good. So that is the nature that is telling you that by nature you are good. But our behaviors, our behavior, because when we say that you are free, God has given you freedom and the ability to reason and things like that also falls into this time. Because if not, that that nature makes you good and all what you do is just good. Maybe when we get to heaven, we'll ask God why he did not uh, make us that way. But the way he has made up made us and the way we have experienced ourselves all through the years, because all what we are looking at today are the experiences of people and also our own experiences. That, that I'm able to make these examples is because of the experience that I have had that you are able to ask that question is because of the experience that you've had as a human being also. So these are experiences that happen and because of that, we've been able to come up with questions and answer and reflections on things like this. But the essential goodness does not mean that it stops you from deciding whether you want to do good or evil. No, it does not. You will not decide by yourself. No, I don't want to do this. I want to, because you are always drawn by different factors, whether to do good or evil, you are always drawn. So that striving is you standing and say, starting and say, no, I have to go in the right direction. I have to move in the right direction. That is the striving we are talking about. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, please keep in mind that this idea of striving is linked also to the discipline of learning and of knowledge. Yeah. So that, that you should strive means that no one can save you except yourself. Yes, because no. you are already saved from within by the nature of your creation. So for you to contextualize this, this terminology, this, this category of striving, see it as the discipline in the practice and learning of math. Because you cannot practice math if you do not know it. You cannot know it if you do not learn it. And this learning, therefore, is the striving that our presenter is articulating beautifully. 